Romans chapter 1, starting with, or chapter 4, excuse me, starting with verse 1. It says, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scripture tells us, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When God, or excuse me, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. So, we got this thing right here letting us know Abraham is the example of our faith. We got this thing right here telling us that it's not anything we can work for. If you remember, we're coming off of chapter 3. This one's ahead of chapter 4. I had to look just to make sure of myself. <laughs> chapter 3, let us know that it's not by obedience to the law that we have salvation. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? We made the example. You can go visit a friend or a family member in another country. You have to obey the laws of that country, but that doesn't make you a citizen of that country. Obeying the law uh, that God has placed in his word does not automatically make you a citizen of heaven. Just because you're a good person, just because you obey the law, you'll get blessings from doing what the Bible says. Don't get me wrong. God will honor his word. But that doesn't mean you're saved. It's only by placing your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, dying for you, taking the punishment and the shame that you and I both deserve, and taking it to the cross, and then burying it. And then, of course, he rose again on the third day, and baptism being a symbol of that very thing, that we are buried with Christ and we come back to newness of life, something we do after confessing Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so if you work for something then it belongs to you as far as it's, it's deserved, it's earned. When I go to work, I get a paycheck. After I put in so many hours, they pay me. And if they don't, we got problems, right? Because I deserve that. It's my money. What, yeah. What's going on? How come, how come you didn't pay me, right? But if I go to work one day and the boss gives me a gift, oh, that's something over there. What's this all about? Oh, thank you. Right? It's something you didn't earn. We'll, we'll, we'll use this, Jimmy. If you were to give me ten million dollars, oh, I believe it, brother. Right? If you were to give me ten million dollars, it would be a gift. There's nothing that I could have done to deserve it. I, I don't deserve ten million dollars. But then later on, if Jimmy asked me to come over to his house one weekend and maybe cut the grass and power wash the house, after that one weekend, if I worked the best I could ever do. I mean, that grass was just, I mean, just perfect. Just, I mean, just to the letter, nice and smooth. Trimmed up real good. And the house was washed. I mean, oh, man, it looked like a brand new building. Do I deserve that 10 million that he gave me? No. Maybe, I don't know, what, what would you pay for somebody to cut your grass and power wash your house? Uh, a couple hundred dollars? Yeah, okay, you could say maybe I earned a couple hundred of that 10 million, at best. But see, if I went and did a terrible job, I mean, horrible. Grass was all patchy, <laughs> forgot to trim, missed half the house, got three out of the four sides of the house. I mean, just, oh, Jimmy, Jimmy wouldn't pay a couple hundred for that at all. No, no, no. <laughs> right? But is that $10 million still mine? Yeah, it's a gift. It's in my bank account. Right? But obedience to the law is not salvation. It's, it's something that God requires of us. Amen. But it's not salvation. Just like when we visit another country, we can't say, oh, I'm an American citizen, I don't have to obey the law here. No. You're still required, even though you're not a citizen, to obey the law. But that doesn't make you a citizen. Right? Okay, let's make sure we understand that. If you worked for it and you earned it, it's a paycheck. But salvation is not something that is earned. It's a free gift from God. You must accept it but it's a free gift from God. Something he did for all of us because he loves us so very much. You cannot, you cannot deserve it. You cannot earn it. We sang about it this morning. Beautifully. Verse 6. He said, David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those 
who are declared righteous without working for it. What did David say? He said, oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Yeah, amen. Anybody in the house a sinner? Yes. Amen. 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 That's right. Oh, what joy for those whose sins have been forgiven. Amen. Oh, there's happiness and joy. There's excitement. There's giddiness in that. You mean, come on, we discussed it last week. You mean Christ already paid the punishment for my sin? He already went to jail for me? Yes. He already went to the electric chair for me? Yes. He, he already did the, the, the work around the, what do you call it when you have to do a, a community service? He already did the community service hours for me? Yes. Whatever the punishment is for whatever the sin is, Christ paid it. That he fulfilled the requirement of the law. Wow. Oh, what joy. Amen. I don't know what you did. Some of you don't. Anyways, I don't know what you did. But I know how bad my sin was. I know how terrible of a person I was. Oh, what joy that when my life ends, I'm not facing that punishment. I'm not facing that eternal death and damnation in heaven. Oh, wow. I get to wake up every day saying, praise God. And if I don't wake up, praise God. I get heaven. Wow. Now, verse 9. Now is the blessings only for Jews? Interesting. Or is it also for the uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted righteous by God because of his faith. But how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised, or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Listen, this salvation is for everybody. Amen. It's not a white man's salvation. It's not a white woman's salvation. It's not a black man's salvation or a black woman's salvation. It's not a, a, a sinner's salvation. Oh, it belongs to us all because we're all sinners. Ah, right. Amen. It doesn't just belong to the rich man or the poor man. Doesn't just belong to the U.S. citizen. Come on now. Oh, we're hitting close to home. All those folks illegally crossing our borders, left and right, just dropping in here and doing all what they want. They need Jesus. Just as much as I need Jesus. The salvation is for them just as much as it's for me. Come on. We don't get to pick and choose who we want to, to share the gospel with. We're supposed to share it with everybody. It's not just for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles only. And if you know anything about your word, that covers all groups in the Bible. That covers everybody. Verse 11, circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised but only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham had before he was circumcised. Listen, circumcision, keeping this PG, is a sign, it's a symbol, it's what the Jews did according to the word of God as a sign of their covenant relationship between the Jewish people and God. Male children at eight days old would get circumcised. And if they somehow missed it, you ask Moses about it in the, in the wilderness. He didn't circumcise one of his kids. And oh, the death angel came down and was like, hey, we, we're taking care of this right now. Or somebody's going to die. It's a sign of a covenant saying, I, I believe what God you promised. I believe but you promised it to us. Now, this is specifically for the Jewish people. Okay. It's a sign. Just like a rainbow is a sign that God will never flood the earth again. It's a sign. It's a sign of the covenant so that when humanity, when it rains, they see the rainbow, they say, oh, that's right. This isn't going to flood the earth because it's a promise. We don't have to fear the rain. And God, when he sees the rainbow, he says, yes, I'm honoring my covenant with you and I will not let the rain come and flood the earth no matter how much you annoy me. <laughs> come on. God loves us. Come on, he loves us. Now, some people like to say we can baptize babies just like we can circumcise eight-day-old people. Same thing. No. No. 
Let's see. Was Jesus a Jew? Yes. Yeah. Was Jesus circumcised at eight days old? Yeah. Yes. Was Jesus baptized when he was a baby? Yeah. No. <laughs> at 30 years old, he went down to the Jordan River and was baptized by John the Baptist. B baptism is something we do after we declare that we have accepted Jesus Christ. Baptism is an outward symbol. If you don't understand, John said, repent. Repent and turn to God for the remission of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins. And so when people would repent and turn to God, he would baptize them. Christ came and said, well, i got to be baptized because I have to fulfill every last part of the Bible. Not that Christ needed saved, but he was doing it out of obedience of what the Word of God was. You understand? So we can sprinkle, sprinkle babies. We can circumcise babies. We do all we want. But until you've confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, baptism ain't going to do you no good. It's just as good as, I don't know, taking a shower. That's a great thing, but it's not what he said. Okay? There's no, there's no symbol, uh, symbolism there. All right? We got that. We're good. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Verse 13. Clearly God's promise is given to the whole earth. Or excuse me. Clearly God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. That is very important. That is very important. A right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. If my boss says, I promise to pay you at the end of the week, every Friday, I promise to pay you if you work 40 hours for me, I mean, I put in the hours. Is the promise, is the promise anything? It's, I promise to pay you. No, 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 you better pay me. <laughs> Your promise doesn't mean anything. I'll work for it. Give me my money or my check. Give me a check. Right? Oh, but if the boss promises, I don't know, at the end of a, a year, if I work for him a year, and at the end of that year, he's going to give me something special. And so I work for him at a year, and at the end of the year, he gives me, I don't know, a, a Bentley. I don't deserve that Bentley. Right? That's expensive. Anybody know about a Bentley? It's an expensive car. Okay, a Corvette, because I hit more close to home. He gives me a Corvette. That's, that's a little different. It's a promise that I can't deserve. No matter how much I work, I can't afford it. And he's given me something that I can't earn. You understand? It's a right relationship with God. And it's a promise from God. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. Same here in the United States. If there was no law, none of us would break the law. But because there is a law, they say on average that you break like 30 laws a day. I didn't even know there was that many. Me and you, all of us, on average, we break about 30 laws a day. The day's not over. You still got time. <laughs> Did you know that? I, I admit to speeding. That's one of mine. For sure. You know. Interesting. The only way to not break the law is to have no law at all. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. There it is. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if, come on, if, somebody say if. Yeah. Thank you. If we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in uh, the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates things or new things out of nothing. Listen, Abraham was old. We're going to get to that here in just a second. Any, any nurses in the house? Maybe somebody can help me out here. How About how old can a man be before he's able to have children anymore? Before he's able to help reproduce? Maybe about 60? Oh, 70? Yeah, before he's allowed about 70. Okay, how about a lady? How old can a lady be before she's no longer able to? About 50? Okay, we're going to go with that. That's fine. So, anybody in the, here that over any women over 50? I'm not going to don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so Abraham didn't have any children with his wife, Sarah. 
She was barren. She couldn't, she couldn't have children. And God came down and said, through you, the whole world will be blessed. And we know that because through his lineage came Jesus Christ, who blessed the whole world. He brought salvation into the world. But among, one of the, among those promises, not only that Jesus Christ was going to come through your line, but that you were going to have as many kids as the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore. And you're talking to a man who ain't had no kids and he was old. And his wife was barren and couldn't have kids. Come on. This is amazing. And so when God told it to Abraham, Abraham, Abraham said, praise God. Yes, sir. I'm going to be a daddy. He didn't doubt. He believed in his heart. And God said, because you believed, I'm going to count that as righteous. And now later, when God fulfilled the promise, later then was the, the covenant of circumcision. He said, okay, so now that you had your child, now at, at eight days old, I want you to circumcise your child. And that's going to be a covenant sign between your people and God. So that we all know that you, you have kept the covenant and I have kept my covenant and the blessing will continue. You see how this works? So Abraham received the word of God before he ever saw it come into fulfillment. And of course, then he was also tested, if you know anything about Abraham and Isaac. <clears throat> but we'll keep going here, verse 18. He says, even when there was no reason for hope, understand, Abraham was barren, and or, uh, Abraham's wife was barren, and him and his wife were old. They were about 10 years apart. So if she was 50 and was done being able to have kids, he was 60, and he was right there around the corner for himself. If, if she was 60 and well over being able to have kids, he was 70 and was for sure being able to quit having kids himself. So we're going to get into it. <clears throat> Even though there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Again, the stars in the sky, the sands of the seashore. Ready? And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age. A hundred. My man was old. You hear me? Even, even at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. You understand, if he was a hundred, that means Sarah was ninety. Any yeah. ninety-year-old ladies in the house this morning? Imagine having your first child at ninety. Imagine waiting all your life to have children and then finally receiving the blessing that God said, I'm going to make you a mom. I'm going to make you a daddy at 100. As a matter of fact, you're going to have so many things. It's going to be like counting the stars. Wow. Wow. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced, understand, fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promised. God is able to do whatever he promised. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. So listen, this is what faith looks like. This is what faith looks like. You should have this type of faith. God said, Abraham, you're going to have children. And there are going to be so many you can't even count them. Your descendants, your children's children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, so forth and so on. There are going to be so many you won't even be able to count them. Understand, Father Abraham was considered the father of the Jews. Are there Jews in the world today? Yes. Anybody know what the number of Jews is? They're in the millions. Is that, is that too many to count? It's too many for me to count. Mm -hmm. It's an estimated number because there's so many of them. And there's been so many of them throughout history. This is what faith looks like. Am I in heaven yet? No. Did God send Jesus to the cross to take my place? Yes. Am I saved? Yes. If I die, I'll receive it, but I haven't died yet, and I must continue to live according to the Word of God by faith. Amen. Now, that should drive me to please God. It should drive me to be obedient to His Word, to His law. 
So it's as if I've already received it, just like Abraham said, I, I, I'm a daddy. I, I got it. It's mine. Even though, if you go back and read the story, it was years. It was years between when God said, you're going to be a father, and when God fulfilled that promise and Sarah actually had a son. Oh, and Abraham got in the mix of it with his wife, and they messed it all up. And today we have a whole other nationality of people just because Abraham messed it all up. He took his wife's handmaid, and she said, listen, I'm too old. Here's my servant. You, you can have my servant. Maybe God will bring the kids through her. God doesn't honor that. That's sin. That's outside of the marriage. God said, no, through you and your wife is this lineage going to happen. And of course, then because of the obedience of the servant girl, God made her children a great nation. She was being obedient to her master, and that's what God says to do in the Bible. So God blessed her and honored her because of it. Being obedient to the word of God brings blessings, folks. Whether you like it or not, if you're obedient to the word of God, God will bless you. That's how it works. And then the Bible tells us that this, this wasn't recorded just so that we can see what Abraham did and say, oh, Abraham, good job, buddy. Pat him on the back. <laughs> no. This is recorded for our benefit. Amen. For us. Yes. You mean we need the Old Testament? Yeah, that's where it's recorded at. Yes. Way early off, too, in that Old Testament. It shows us what faith looks like. It shows us what obedience looks like. It shows us what God's promises look like. And then we don't give up. Even if it's been years. Finally, in verse 25, he says, talking about Jesus Christ here, he was handed over to die because of our sins. He was raised to life to make us right with God. <coughs> Jesus didn't go to the cross for his sins, he was sinless. He was without spot. He went to the cross for our sins. And then he was raised to new life for our justification. We'll get into more of that in chapter 5. But to make us right with God. Wow. If you've been saved this morning, that means that you've been forgiven. It also means that you've been made right with God. You can stand before an almighty God and cry out to him and ask him for help or praise him or worship him or just come and spend time in his presence. And you can do it being made right. If you understand anything about uh, the way that, that things used to be set up, we don't get it here because we vote on a president and then you know we make an appointment and we go see the man, if that's, if that's how it works. Maybe he'll make an appointment come see us. But the way it used to be is there was a king, and if the king did not request you to be in his presence, and you just walked all up into the king's palace. Just walked right up. Hey, king, how you doing? That was it. They kid They put you to death. You don't approach the king without, without him saying, come see me. That's not a lie. That's not a thing. You do that, you die. Oh, but see, there's this man named Jesus. He yeah. said so he made us right with God. He forgave us of our sins first. And then he made us right with God. So that now when we enter into God's presence, we can say, hey God, how you doing? Oh, there's no death. There's joy. And God can look at us and say, I'm doing good, son. How are you? I know she's been eating something. Let me help you today. I know that she's been looking for something. I know that she's missing something. I know that you're a little lax over here. Let me, let me help you work on that. Let me get you right. Let me fix you up. Let me bless you. Oh, man, it's so beautiful. It's so good. Now most of us, all of us, if I, can, if I can put us all in the same category, we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior because it gets us out of hell. <laughs> Let's just be blunt about that. Anybody here want to go to hell like that's your, that's your big goal in life? Yeah. Exactly. So most of us accept Jesus Christ to get out of hell. It's more of a business transaction. I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a Savior. I don't want to burn. But as we read in chapter 4, that should grow into a relationship. It should be a relationship. It may not start off that way at first, but it should grow into a relationship, a father-son relationship, a father-daughter relationship, a best friend relationship, 
a, a servant and a king relationship. There's so many ways that we approach God. Our Lord and Savior. Our Master and Savior. But at the beginning, it's more like just a Savior. Because who are you looking for? <laughs> Get out of jail free. Huh? Come on. I guarantee you, you can go down to the jailhouse right now and say, any of you guys want to get out, just let me know. I'll, I'll stay here for you. You can go home. They'll all take that. <laughs> They'll all let you stay in the jailhouse in their place. But see, afterwards, there should be a relationship. So many Christians miss out on that. They accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Yeah, yeah, you can take my place. That's great. I'll give them sure, Yes. Get out of jail free. Hallelujah. But then they keep on going, living their own life, doing the same thing over and over and over again. And it never grows into a relationship with God. It never grows into something of, Lord, here I am. This is my life. Do with it what you want. It's now yours. It doesn't belong to me, God. You paid the price. You paid the price of your son and bought me. I'm yours. Do with me what you will. And let him lead us into his plan, into what he wants to do. This morning, is your salvation a business transaction? Is it, is it something that you did initially just to get out of hell and you realize that nothing's changed in your life? It's still the same. There's nothing new. There's nothing different. Christ said that if, if the Bible says if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and behold, all things are made new. We're supposed to be new. If you're not new this morning, I reckon you know, you know, get, get right with the Lord. If you still got the same old anger, the same old guilt, the same old gossip, the same old nastiness, the same old terrible attitude, the same old bad habits, come on. The same old sin every day, every weekend, every whatever. That, that, ain't, that ain't being made new. If you want to be made right with the Lord, it's real simple. <clears throat> Come down to the altar. You pray to God. You ask Him to be Lord and Savior of your life. You admit that you're a sinner and you're in need of a Savior. You say, I believe what you did on the cross, Jesus. I believe that you took my place and that I deserve that. But Lord, I, I don't want to die and go to hell, but instead I was living all eternity with you. Here I am. Cleanse me. Change me. Come and live in me. And make me new. It's that simple. Because God did all the work for you. He paid the price for you. Oh, come on. If you need anything else this morning, healing, deliverance, anything. The altars are open.